Now, we've gone through two cells of the three cell model. Now we're going to get to the middle cell, the last cell, called the feral cell. Let's get into it. The third cell, the middle cell, is a completely different kind of cell. The first two, the Hadley cell and the polar cell, were thermally driven by warming at a latitude that resulted in rising air. Look at this cell in the middle. It's completely different. The rising air is up in the cold 60s. The sinking air is up in the relatively warmer 30s. That doesn't make sense. Rising air should be warm. Sinking air should be cold. Why is there even a cell here? It's not thermally driven. It's actually driven by eddies from the fast jet streams that border both sides of the feral cell. Let's look into that a bit. This schematic will really help you out. When we have the Hadley cell, we know as it sinks, it develops into a subtropical jet. When we look at the polar cell, we know that at this, as this air rises due to the convergent warm and cold air in the 60s, we also have a very strong polar jet due to that gradient. These jets can be so fast that they set in play eddies. And eddies are um, swirls of air that produce turbulence because they opposite they work in the opposite direction of the regular flow. In many cases, when you have forces at high speed, you'll find eddies around it. And the eddies can do quite a job. We'll look into that a little bit more soon. Let's look into it a bit now. What forces are we talking about? that might be in conflict at these high speeds in, these, in this polar jet. Let's talk about the forces that we know. We know that there's a pressure gradient force going from south to north, going from warm air to cold air. We know that there's a Coriolis force deflecting to the right. The Coriolis is faster the greater speed you have and the greater differential between the two, um, the, the, the two temperatures. We know that there's gravity as a force at play with this jet. Gravity is everywhere. And we know that there are some areas in here which will be dealing with compressional warming as this air starts to sink. Not as important, but it's there a bit. So the three big ones are the pressure gradient force, the Coriolis force, the gravity force. At 250 miles an hour, some things can go haywire. Some things can go in reserve course. I drew some eddies out here for you. This is what causes turbulence at 30,000 feet. This eddy motion that we're talking about, this circular motion in the opposite direction, something that we can look at when we look at the direction of the polar cell. The direction of the polar cell is in a counterclockwise motion. And the polar jet will go in a counterclockwise motion, but it'll go on a westerly course, right? It'll go on a westerly course, the counterclockwise motion. The eddies, on the other hand, will go in a clockwise motion because they'll go in the opposite direction. Same thing here. From the Hadley cell, we have a really strong Hadley cell here. We have a weaker subtropical jet. That weaker subtropical jet is in a clockwise direction, but it's also heading on a westerly course. These will, these eddies that come off of this fast jet, not as fast or as powerful as the polar jet, these will also support a clockwise motion that has no basis in a thermally driven cell. Strictly driven by eddies and how powerful they can be from the upper atmosphere and the jet streams. When we talk about 
the um, third cell. It does a lot to explain some of the wet winters that we know about in our area around the 40s. Um, and in particular, up north of us in Vermont and so forth, getting up toward the 60s. It explains wet winters for us. So this model seems to explain wet winters because in the wintertime, the polar cell will move south with all the cold air from the North Pole. So in moving south, it's going to move this convected area, this rising air, rising slow um, clouds and snow, surface low, it's going to move it down south of 60 and it will probably be in the area around Vermont, around New York. That makes sense for the wet winters that we notice. This model may really, um, may really help us out quite a bit. And the third cell also explains the dry summers that we generally have around our area, and particularly the dry summers that you notice up in Vermont. Um, so in the summer, the warm air from the equator has more of a push and pushes the polar cell further north. And in pushing the, the, um, the uh, polar cell further north, we push the convection and the rising slow clouds and snow up closer to the 60s. And we give ourselves the dry area of the middle feral cell. So it can explain our dry summers. And in addition, um, it'll definitely explain the prevailing westerlies of the jet stream. That's a given. And I wanted you to put all three of these cell models together, the Hadley cell, the polar cell, the feral cell, to understand that they move all the air within a hemisphere. All of these working together move this, the air in a hemisphere. This is actually the GO satellite at night, which can pick up IR and will pick up even IR from low clouds and IR from high clouds. It's a beautiful exhibit at night. And not only that, but the low clouds, which probably are associated with stratus clouds and precipitation are blue, and the high clouds, which are probably uh, associated with ice and cirrus clouds, are white. And what you see here is you see surface movements and you have here the equator right along here. This is Central America. This is the coast of Africa. You have here the 30 degree parallel, Jacksonville, Florida, Tropic of Ca Cancer we're talking about here. And so we have an area where we would expect to see surface trade winds coming from the northeast to the southwest. And look what I see. I see surface blue clouds in a direction that is coming from the northeast to the southwest. Those are northeasterly trade winds right on the surface. And right above it, I start to see the higher clouds that are moving in a prevailing westerly fashion. Look at those higher clouds right there. They're beautiful. Right, you see more prevailing westerlies up here, higher clouds. So here's a way that you can really see that this model starts to come into um, effect. You can always look at the ghost satellite at night and look at the movement of air in the Hadley cell from the equator to 30 degrees. Look at the movement of air in the polar cell, 60 degrees to the North Pole. Have a look at it. It's really wonderful to see. And I think that would do one more. I wanted you to wrap this up by knowing that surface lows, which are associated with the equator and with 60 degrees, 60 degrees north, 60 degrees south around the equator, those are associated with convection and clouds and precipitation, like you notice in the intertropical convergence zone which we'll learn about next chapter, rainfall around the equator, tropical rainforests. And in the um, mid-latitudes around the 60s and down into the 50s, mostly wet in those areas, 
that's where the convection is, especially during the winter for us. So that is surface lows associated with precipitation and surface highs, which you notice around the world at each of the poles, the North Pole and the South Pole, and you notice them at the 30 degree mark, Tropic of Cancer, Tropic of Capricorn, right around the equator, all right? When you think of surface highs, you think of dry air, not only not warm at the equator, but there is some compressional warming, it's relative, at the poles, certainly dry at the poles, certainly dry in the 30s where all the deserts are. Hope this helps you out. See you on Global Circulations on the next video.